Have you heard about Graham Hancock's controversial show on Netflix, Ancient Apocalypse? Well, today on Cross Defense, we're going to explore some of his presuppositions, some of what he's looking at as he's striving to explore these ancient sites in human history. And we're going to bring it all back to Jesus. Jesus and the Bible, of course, with Genesis 1 to 11. Stay tuned for The Flood, Netflix, and Christ here on Cross Defense. I'm Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California, and your host right here on Cross Defense from KFUO Radio, kfuo.org, where Christ is for you anytime, anywhere. Here at Cross Defense, our aim is to specifically equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul all with God's Word, and not just for your sake, my friend, but for the sake of your neighbor so that you will be equipped to serve, excited to serve, and comforted so that you can serve your neighbor. And with that said, let's talk about the flood, pyramids, Netflix, and of course, Jesus. My wife brought one of Netflix's current top 10 shows to my attention. Have you heard about this show? Have you watched this show yet? Ancient Apocalypse? If not, consider this your spoiler alert. This show popped up on her radar because it was labeled the most dangerous show on Netflix by Stuart Heritage over at The Guardian. It was being discussed on a podcast that my wife listens to because Mr. Heritage asks why such a show was allowed. Now, that's an interesting First Amendment discussion in its own right, but I was more interested in the show itself. I mean, it has the word ancient and apocalypse married together. If that doesn't pique the theologian's mind... I don't know what will. So I binge watched it. Yep, I binge watched it. And I loved it. It's a show that truly excites the imagination. I watched it without any presuppositions about the journalist and host of the show, upon whose work the entire thing is based. All I knew was that this show was considered dangerous. I now know why. Like Christians, and like all who approached the history of man and the world, the history of the world, from the historic traditional creationist view, Graham Hancock, the originator of the show, the host, the journalist in question, is on the outside of mainstream science. Therefore, he's controversial. He, therefore, he's dangerous. Yes, just like you. He is a danger. To the mainstream thought that has rejected a creator. Now, I'm not under any false illusions that Mr. Hancock believes in a creator. I don't know what his biblical views are or his uh, religious views are, but I do know he's outside the mainstream and therefore he's dangerous. So welcome to the club, Mr. Hancock. You're in good company. The church has been outside the mainstream for a while now. We too are considered dangerous. How can we, with the gospel, with a view founded and formed by scripture, be allowed to propagate our worldview? Oh, I know, it's radical. So why did I love the show though? Because the whole thing is built upon the recognition of a global catastrophic flood. No, I'm not dark and twisted. I don't like thinking about destruction and mayhem, but I do like thinking about the Bible. And a global catastrophic flood is recorded in the Bible, as you probably know if you're listening to this show. Now, on the show Ancient Apocalypse, it's referred to by today's uh, common language, the secular cosmetologist's language, as the Younger Dryas. We know it as Noah's Flood. And the show's theory is that it is the universally experienced deluge, flood, that resulted in the construction of, get this, megalithic structures, mainly pyramidal in shape all over the planet. So pyramids. And we do know from sources, this is, you know, this is not just from the show. We all know that there are pyramids, ziggurats, uh, towering triangular structures, however you want to call them, whatever you want to call them, uh, not only in Egypt, but we find them in Asia, we find them in South America. We have mounds that we find here in North America, things that are raising up out of the ground 
with a wider footprint at the bottom and a narrower point at the top. So something that's pyramidal in shape, if that's a word. I think it's a word. Now, this alone excites the Christian, the Christian imagination, doesn't it? Why? Because of the Hebrew word migdal. Migdal. It's the word used by Moses in the inspired record of early human history. Genesis 11, 4 says, Of the post-flood descendants of Noah, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They built a massive tower, a massive migdal. Migdal in Hebrew is the word translated as tower. Now you hear the the word tower, and perhaps if you're like me, the first thing that pops into your mind is, is something along the lines of the Eiffel Tower, or perhaps the Sears Tower, although I think it has a different name now. This sort of thing, a, a, a high skyscraper, a tower, a high structure. The end, period. Drop the mic. We're done. No. Over and over again in the Old Testament, Migdal conveys a military tower. That is a fortress. It's a fortified tower. And abundantly, we see Migdal as a last line of defense sort of structure. It's the place that you want to go to, built so that you can go to in retreat from your enemy as your enemy is sacking your city. This is how we're to see God, isn't it? As Luther's famous, most famous Reformation hymn says, A mighty fortress, that would be Migdal if it was in Hebrew, is our God. Christ is our place of retreat. Into his name we go, to the cross. He is our only, indeed our last line of defense from our old evil foe, that serpent, that snake, Satan. Now, another way that Migdal is used is for a watchtower. So a watchtower over, over a vineyard, say. Again, this brings to mind preparedness due to potential confrontation with disaster. That's why you have a watchtower. You're watching to protect. You're watching to guard against. You're watching to be ready for, right? But there's more. Figuratively, Migdal is used in reflection of a flower bed. I know, it just seems like we took a hard left turn, but we didn't really. We had the watchtower thing, right, which is over vineyards. So we have plants in the ground, and now we're talking about flower beds, so it all connects. It is a reflection of a flower bed that has a pyramidal shape, so a wider footprint that's built up to a narrower point. John Walton with the Archaeological Group, Associates for Biblical Research, points out that Migdal is derived from the Hebrew word gadol, which means to be large or great. And that, get this, it is somewhat parallel to the etymological root of the Akkadian word zikarot, which comes from the word zikaru, meaning to be high. And not the way you're thinking if you're out here in California, not that kind of high, but to be tall, <laughs> high. Now there's some exciting stuff here. For our imaginations, our Christian, biblically formed imaginations, how we think, how we perceive things. That this, and this further equips our minds. Not only do we have good reason to understand the Tower of Babel to be shaped like a ziggurat, that is, a pyramid, but just from looking at the Hebrew word migdal, we begin to see a source of reasoning behind why ancient people built such large megalithic structures, great high structures. The history of Nimrod and Babel connects largeness with greatness. As Genesis 11, 4 says, the people who constructed the megalithic tower of Babel with its top in the heavens did so for two purposes. First, 
to make a name for themselves. That was number one, glory, greatness. Moses tells us Nimrod was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel in the land of Shinar. Nimrod, Martin Luther tells us, comes from the Hebrew word marah, which means to fall away, to rebel. And that's exactly what was happening at the construction of the Tower of Babel, the Migdal of Babel. See, after the flood, God made a covenant with Noah that was for him and for his offspring after him. Genesis 9, 9. God promised, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Genesis 8, 21 to 9, 1. And this brings us to the second purpose of the Migdal of Babel, to keep man from being dispersed over the whole face of the earth. They were told to multiply and fill the earth, but they don't want to. See, if man was to make a name for himself, seek his own glory, he would have to do it in Marad, rebellion of God. And if man was going to rebel against God, not dispersing over the whole earth as he was commanded to do, what would he need? A fortress. A fortress to protect himself from God's wrath. See, Noah's descendants didn't trust in God. They had fallen away, as Nimrod's name reveals, and the tower, the, the Migdal of Babel, the account of it records this for us. God had promised not to attack mankind with a flood ever again. He even went so far as to hang up his battle bow in the heavens as a sign for man, so we would never forget that God had made peace with us. Each time it rained and we thought, whoa, is he going to flood us again? Is he going to bring his wrath upon us and wipe out all of it? No, there's the bow. I see it. And it's horizontal. It's hanging up in the clouds. God is not shooting down his arrows of wrath. No, no, no. This is just part of the natural fallen world now. It rains from time to time. God's made a promise with us. He's made peace with us. See, that's what the rainbow is. It's God showing that he's not at war with man. His bow is hanging. It's not in his hand. But Nimrod's people defied God and feared that he would unleash the power of the heavens upon them again. <laughs> Talk about a guilty conscience. Their megalithic namesake had to be a fortress. Their enemy was, after all, God. They had made God their enemy. He didn't make them his, their enemy. They had made him their enemy. This has excited my imagination ever since I read Josephus's record of the Babel event. The ark rested in the mountains of Ararat. We know this from scripture. But as the sons of Noah went forth from the ark, Genesis 11 tells us that the people migrated from the east where they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. Josephus is going to elaborate on this for us. He puts it in a particular way in the Antiquities of the Jews, chapter 4, which is labeled the Tower of Babel, Confusion of Tongues, B.C. 2233. Now, before we get to that, we're almost at a break. So before we get to that, Let's pause, and I want to encourage you to send me any of your thoughts and questions up to this point as we think about whether it's Ancient Apocalypse on Netflix. Have you watched it? What do you think about it? But as we think about the Tower of Babel, I want us to 
to really dwell on this kind of a story, the Old Testament stories, these ones that are very familiar to us, are we overlooking their power, overlooking their details? When we get right back, we will look at Josephus, the antiquities of the Jews, and what he has to say about the Tower of Babel that will enlighten us further and excite the imagination to consider that the tower was actually a fortress. Migdal, as, Bible, as the Bible uses that word. We'll be right back. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high quality KFUO branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store. Welcome back to Cross Defense. I'm in Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, chapter 4, which is labeled Tower of Babel, Confusion of Tongues, B.C. 2233. And this is what it says. Take a listen to this, my friends. Now the sons of Noah were three, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, born a hundred years before the deluge. These, first of all, descended from the mountains into the plains and fixed their habitation there. Coming from the mountains... Mount Ararat is where the ark settled, down into the plains, and that's where they start to inhabit. And they persuaded others who were greatly afraid of the lower grounds on account of the flood, and so were very loath to come down from the higher places. <laughs> Natural, okay, makes sense, to venture to follow their example. So, hey guys, it's okay down here. Come on down, come on down, come out of the mountains, come on, it's nice down here. All right. Now, the plain in which they first dwelt was called Shinar. God also commanded them to send colonies abroad for the thorough peopling of the earth, that they might not raise seditions among themselves, but might cultivate a great part of the earth and enjoy its fruits after a plentiful manner. But they were so ill-instructed that they didn't obey God, for which reason they fell into calamities and were made sensible by experience of what sin they had been guilty. For when they flourished with a numerous youth, God admonished them again to send out colonies, but they, imagining the prosperity they enjoyed was not derived from the favor of God, but supposing that their own power was the proper cause of their plentiful condition that they were in, sounds a lot like America today, they did not obey him. Nay, they added to this their disobedience to the divine will, the suspicion that they were therefore ordered to send out separate colonies, that being divided asunder, they might the more easily be, be oppressed. So they have fear of the flood. There's encouragement to come out of the mountains into the plains. But the Lord also said to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But they are now seeing this as divide and conquer, that God might attack again. And he wants to send us out so we're not, we don't have strength of number. He wants us to spread out so we're more susceptible to his attack. This cynicism, this sinful doubt of God's word and his covenant with Noah, his forefront in Josephus' account, his commentary on, on the Genesis account. Let us continue. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe to God as if it was through his means that they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence upon his power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. For that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach. 
<laughs> and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So Nimrod is placing himself up as this king who will oppose God, and he will build a fortress that they can all retreat into, a fortress that is too high for the waters to reach, an artificial Mount Ararat. Yeah? Come on down to the plains. I'm going to build a mountain down here so that if the flood comes again, we can live as safely as we would up there. Now, the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. I'll pause right here. This is much the way modern men see church. Something that's weak. Right? The, the, the opponents of the gospel want to call us uh, simple-minded that we're believing in superstitions because we're you know, fearful of, of confronting the truth and these sorts of things. So from that perspective, they see us as weak. But also manliness, maleness, sees church as something uh, lesser than you know, the rough tumble manliness out there in the world. And so there's this parallel here between they, they esteemed it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. So have pride, be strong, be courageous in the face of God. Stand against him is their mantra. And so they built a tower, neither sparing any pains nor being in any degree negligent about the work. And by reason of the multitude of hands employed in the building of it, it grew very high, sooner than anyone could expect. But the thickness of it was so great, and it was so strongly built, that thereby its great height seemed upon the view to be less than it really was. It was built of burnt brick, cemented together with mortar made of bitumen, that it might not be liable to admit water. So Josephus tells us here they built a waterproof artificial mountain. <laughs> They're building a fixed ark, if you will. When God saw that they acted so madly, he didn't resolve to destroy them utterly since they were not grown wiser by the destruction of the former sins, but he caused a tumult among them. Now, why did God not do that? Well, he promised he wouldn't. God keeps his word. He promised he wouldn't. So he caused a tumult among them by producing in them diverse languages and causing that through the multitude of those languages, they should not be able to understand one another. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon. Because of the confusion of that language, which they readily understood before, for the Hebrews mean by the word Babel, confusion. The Sibi also makes mention of this tower and of the confusion of the language when she says thus, When all men were of one language, some of them built a high tower as if they would thereby ascend up to heaven. But the gods sent storms of wind and overthrew the tower and gave every one his peculiar language. And for this reason, it was that the city was called Babylon. But as to the plain of Shinar and the country of Babylonia, Hastius mentions when he says this, uh, such of the priests as were saved took the sacred vessels of Jupiter or conqueror and came to Shinar of Babylonia. That's what Josephus says in chapter four of his Antiquities of the Jews about the Tower of Babel. So back to the ancient apocalypse show on Netflix. <laughs> Mr. Hancock, Graham Hancock, repeatedly notes that the ancient megalithic places that he visits, and he goes to uh, Gunung Padang, I think that's how you say it, Cholula, the temples of Malta, all these kind of places. He even talks about Atlantis. You get references to the pyramids, all this. I mean, great stuff. The, he, he says they have overt ties to the movement and knowledge of the celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars. And he repeatedly highlights that the artwork and the language at these sites is fixated on serpents. Exciting stuff, yeah? Yeah. Now, I don't think 
Mr. Hancock is particularly friendly to Christianity, and that's okay. We don't need Graham Hancock to be an ally in that sense. In fact, because he has spoken harsh words about the church in public, which I since learned after watching the the Netflix show, you can go to Joe Rogan's podcast and see his lengthy interview. That's kind of where all this started, I think, uh, for the Netflix show anyways. Hancock apparently has been writing books for decades. But this only makes me appreciate Graham Hancock and the show all the more. Why? Because he's, he's taking the cultural conversation, which has been dominated by the atheistic evolutionary mainstream scientists. He's taking that conversation back toward the biblical truth. And, and this is the point, the major point, he's doing it without the perceived bias of being a Christian. That's useful for us, for the truth, for truth holders. That's useful in the same way that the extra biblical acknowledgments of Josephus, his commentary, not only on Genesis, but of Christ's resurrection. Yes, Josephus talks about Christ's resurrection. It's, this, it's useful in the same way that having a non-Christian Jewish historian in the first century funded by Roman patronage Having that kind of material adds apologetic weight to the biblical truth. The same thing. An enemy of your enemy is my friend or something along those lines. I don't know how that saying goes, but that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. It helps our our case from an apologetic perspective. We don't need to help with the case. The Holy Spirit's the one doing all the work. But as you try to express the truth to your neighbor, it is helpful when you can point to those outside the biblical camp the Christian camp, and say, see, others come to the same conclusion from their own angle. And so, Graham Hancock's books and his Netflix show are moving the popular conversation away from evolutionary thought and back toward biblical truth. And for that, we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. The show holds the premise that there was this uh, advanced ancient civilization that that traveled the world after the flood and passed down their knowledge to the the now post-flood peoples of the world. The primary evidence for this, according to Graham Hancock, is the existence of these astronomically informed megalith structures found all over the world. They're all connected. He thinks they point to a civilization that lived somewhere around 12,800 years ago. Now you, you thoughtful Christian, you undoubtedly have a lot of questions for Mr. Hancock. I do. But you also find some very exciting similarities. I found myself constantly thinking throughout the entire show that if he had started from a position of knowledge... If he had just started from a position of true knowledge, I mean, the fear of the Lord, right? That's the true knowledge. Proverbs 1, 7, beginning of knowledge, the fear of the Lord. If he had started there with a ministerial reason being formed by scripture, he would have got a lot more out of his exploration of these ancient sites. It's a bummer for him that he didn't. But as it is, his consideration circles the truth so, uh, vehemently or so rapidly or so consistently, I don't know, it's just constantly circling the truth, that it's a useful thing for us Orthodox believers, because if nothing else, it stirs up our imagination to go back into the text and look at what it says. And so let's continue to use some of his considerations for today's show and and probably even for some future shows to further edify ourselves, be edified by God to say it properly. This is very fitting. All of this is very fitting, I find, given that this past Sunday's gospel reading, the second Sunday in Advent, at least according to the one-year lectionary, we heard Jesus in Luke 21, 25, 27 say, and there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea the flood, and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding. 
or what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. In the parallel passage for this past Sunday's gospel reading, Matthew 24, we hear, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. That's Matthew 24, 36 to 39. And it always makes me think of uh, the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish, and how the closing of the door, they're left out. And the Lord says, I don't know you. So stop and consider this for a second. Jesus is talking about his return at the end of time. His, what is commonly called his second return, his final return. Think about how it will be both forecasted by signs in the sun and moon and stars, and yet it will also catch people unaware. And then Jesus takes us all the way back in human history to Noah, to the time before the global flood that destroyed all but a remnant of humanity, Noah and his family, eight souls in all. Jesus takes us to within, if we're taking Noah's genealogy just at face value, now this is debatable stuff, the dating, especially if we really, we really can't date in this pre-flood era. But if we're taking it at face value, Jesus takes us to within the first 1,656 years of the world, if we do the math there. When we do this, don't forget this. All mankind spoke the same language and were not yet dispersed over all the earth. So Graham Hancock's theory is that there was an advanced pre-flood civilization that traveled the world, passing down their memory of this catastrophic event to the people of the world, who then built religions based on the stories they heard, carving them into stones, and that they used them to build their temples, which are these massives, massive and, and mountainous structures, and, and that within them is this warning. That's another part of the show that he's warning the future generations of what happened and what might come again. Now, these massive mountainous things, that's right, mountainous uh, megaliths are, as I said, artificial mountains with their tops high above the, the, the flood waters. They're, they're not susceptible by the flood waters. That was the goal of Nimrod. They, they pierce the, the sky. They're pyramids, ziggurats, migdal, mountainous fortresses of retreat. Now hold on to that for a second because we really want to dwell a little longer on the fact that Jesus has told us that his return will be similar to the floods of Advent, which is the same conclusion that Hancock is driving to, although he's not talking about Jesus. He's just talking about in generic, vague language that maybe these ancients were trying to tell us something about the future. Well, we know, biblical Christians know, that's true. And let me tell you exactly what that is. That's what Jesus is doing right here in this week's one-year lectionary gospel reading. Just like as it was back then with Noah, that's how it will be then in the future when I come back. So pay attention. Now, next episode, next week, we're going to talk about actually how the, the devil twists this message to form these religions. So hang on to that. I know I got you holding on to a lot of things, right? Are you juggling a bunch of balls right now? They're about all about to fall. <laughs> well, hang on to all these things, okay? We're having some fun here, and we really are dealing with things that equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul. Jesus takes us to within... 1,656 years, if we want to use that math. It takes us to, to just before Noah enters the ark. And Noah was 600 years when the floodwaters came upon the earth. We're in Genesis 7, 6 for all of this, right? 7 and then 6 for that last part. This is to say that Jesus refers us back to the pre-flood civilization that would retain, through Noah's descendants, a shared memory of the flood 
and many other things. Now hold on to that one more time. You're like, Pastor Brad, well, you have me holding on to everything. Well, we got to take a break. So hold on to all of that for about a minute or so. We'll be back right after this break. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Put this wisdom of God into practice by listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple, and faithful pastors from around the world help sharpen my faith in Christ every episode. I know you'll be blessed by listening and studying God's Word with us. Listen to Sharper Iron weekdays at 8 a.m. on KFUO and on demand at KFUO.org, the KFUO radio app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. You still holding on to everything? You didn't drop it yet, did you? All right, we're back. So Jesus refers us back to the pre-flood civilization that would retain through Noah's descendants, as I said, this shared memory of these events. When Moses penned the first 11 chapters of Genesis, the first 11, he is recording the part of humanity's history that is shared by all of us, by, as you would say, Jews and Gentiles alike, every tribe, nation, and language. Which is why we find that the events recorded up to the construction of the Tower of Babel appear in other ancient accounts of the origins of the world. Mythologies of different people groups and religious reliefs in in various temples and sanctuaries across the world have these accounts. And we heard some of that reported by the Sibi in Josephus, right? So in the Netflix show, Ancient Apocalypse, the thought is that this ancient pre-flood civilization, after barely surviving the catastrophe, traveled all over the world teaching the local peoples their knowledge, including agriculture and how to read the stars. They gave them their their technological know-how, leading them uh, to, to build these amazing structures that were oriented, aligned with the stars and the movement of the sun and the moon in the seasonal skies. Fascinating stuff. Excites the imagination. And that's the best thing about the show, because the visual, the video work of the show, and the narrative access to these ancient locations is phenomenal. And it's fixated, we find out, fixated on the ancient constellations with carvings of serpents and stories of the old world lost, the promise of a restoration to come. Now, are you thinking, when you hear that, are you thinking about the serpent in the Garden of Eden, the promise of a Savior in Genesis 3.15? I hope so. I hope that's where your mind goes. Our imaginations are excited by this stuff. Theology is awesome, and it's everywhere. I love it. So, let me ask you this, my friend. Has your unbelieving neighbor ever tried to attack Christianity with the position that Jesus is just a recapitulation of the ancient hero motif. Have you ever heard this? That he's, he's one of Joseph Campbell's thousand faces of mankind's universal hero, this kind of a thing. Maybe, I hope, maybe you've been blessed to never experience this. If that's the case for you, praise be to God. Thank you, Lord, for blessing that person, having never gone through that. Nonetheless, equip your mind with me, my friend, for potential encounters of this sort. The accusation is that the Savior story, as a genre, as a motif, is found in mythologies all across the planet. Therefore, as the argument goes, disproving the Gospels by way of uh, diluting the Gospels water, right? The blessed water. Never fear, dear Cross Defense listener. Our Christian soda hasn't gone flat. We still got the fizz, my friends. What is Genesis 3.15? It is the proto-euangelion, the first gospel message of the scriptures. It's the promise that the woman's offspring will crush the serpent's head. Where is this found? Well, I just told you, Genesis 3.15. But for today's show, what am I driving at? This is found in the pre-flood history that's shared by all humanity. Moses wrote this down so that the Israelite people 
would possess a clear articulation of this promise. But as the Bible clearly communicates, the promise of our Savior is universal for both Jew and Gentile, the whole world. So we're not surprised to find the Savior motif and even other characters mentioned in mythologies that behaving like a Savior, because it's part of our Genesis 1 to 11 shared human cultural history. So it seems to me that a wise person who recognizes that there is a shared Savior story throughout humanity would recognize the universality of the need for a Savior and therefore be moved to inquire about the various proposed Saviors in the various stories. He might want to ask, what do we know about them? Do any of them measure up? Is there anything to this ancient wisdom that I should probably listen to? When we do this, the shared promise of the Savior gives immense weight to the Savior found born among the Jewish people about, you know, 2,000 years ago, the man called Jesus of Nazareth. C.S. Lewis puts it this way in God in the Dock, and this is very well said. Now, as a myth transcends thought, incarnation transcends myth. The heart of Christianity is a myth, which is also a fact. The old myth of the dying God, without ceasing to be myth, comes down from the heaven of legend and imagination to the earth of history. It happens at a particular date, in a particular place, followed by definable historical consequences. We pass from a balder or an Osiris dying nobody knows when or where to a historical person crucified. It's all in order under Pontius Pilate. By becoming fact, it does not cease to be myth. That is the miracle. God is more than a God, not less. Christ is more than Balder, not less. We must not be ashamed of the mythical radiance resting on our theology. We must not be nervous about parallels and pagan Christs. They ought to be there. They ought to be there. It would be a stumbling block if they weren't there. We must not, in false spirituality, withhold our imaginative welcome. If God chooses to be mythopoeic and is not the sky, itself a myth, shall we refuse to be mythopathic? For this is the marriage of heaven and earth, perfect myth and perfect fact, claiming not only for our love and or our obedience, but also our wonder and delight addressed to the savage, the child, and the poet in each one of us, no less than to the moralist, the scholar, and the philosopher. That's C.S. Lewis. Amazing stuff. So Graham Hancock has an ancient advanced people teaching other local hunter-gatherer people their old advanced ways, predominantly agriculture and astronomy, but he doesn't seem pressed to offer an explanation, an explanation for the origin of these local peoples. Why? Well, because he's still using an evolutionary line of reasoning, and it's, it's obscuring his understanding of the origin of mankind. So he's dealing with the flood, and he's zoomed in on the reason for the similarities between ancient pyramid-shaped structures and other megalithic construction sites that share this common interest in tracking the stars, he's, he's trying to synthesize mainstream science, the, the chronology of man according to evolution, with evidence that contradicts that very evolutionary hypothesis. How did hunter-gatherers learn to build massive structures with fine-tuned details informed by the sun, moon, and stars? This is where the truth of scripture, as you know, my friends, would really sharpen Hancock's thinking. Because he's trying to marry two things that will never work out together. See, Noah's descendants are the remnant of Hancock's 
advanced pre-flood civilization, and they are the same hunter-gatherers. They're both. Genesis 10 gives us a summary. Chapter 11 supplies the details to that summary. Here we go. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt. <laughs> so it seems there was a family propensity to build large pyramids, right? Uh, Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ra'ama, and Sabtika. The sons of Ra'ama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kelna, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth Ir, Kela, and Resen between Nineveh and Kela. That is the great city. This is Genesis 6, 1 and 6 to 12. So as we've seen today in today's show, there is the beginning, the beginning of the correct answer. When we look into Genesis, the beginning of the correct answer to Hancock's overarching question. He wants to know who is this advanced ancient civilization that survived the near destruction of the world by flood. Who is this people group? Where'd they come from? Who are these guys? And we say, hey, bud, it's in the Bible. Noah's descendants. Yes, the people of Noah's day were advanced. Noah himself was, an intelligent, was intelligent enough to construct the ark <laughs> yeah, God, I mean, God gave him the blueprint, but he had the intelligence to follow that blueprint. It's evolutionary thought, my friend, that dupes us into thinking that the more ancient the people, the less intelligent they were. Nimrod, the first mighty man, a hunter, founded Babel, where the people possessed the advanced knowledge to build a fortified tower with its top high in the sky. Ancient people were brilliant. So brilliant that God says, this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Genesis eleven six. See, it's evolutionary thought that controls mainstream science and shapes academia and, and popular culture's view of history. They're magisterial reason is clouding our thoughts and perpetuating our historical amnesia. Working with ministerial reason, reason that is under God's word, we see that hunter-gatherers weren't taught agriculture and astronomy by an independent advanced civilization, but that the advanced civilization was from the beginning agricultural in nature and also then produced mighty hunters. Adam and Eve were placed in a garden and given dominion over all creation to cultivate it. It was because of sin that man was removed from the garden that God planted to work the uncultivated ground from which Adam was taken, land where thistles and thorns came up alongside the fruit of the earth, weeds and wheat growing alongside one another, just as Jesus will talk about when he talks about the, the weeds and the wheat together, the chaff and the wheat, right? Adam's first son, Cain, is described as a worker of the ground. In Genesis 4, 2, not as a hunter, he's described as a worker of the ground. He's a farmer, agriculture. His brother Abel was a shepherd. That's agriculture too. Which if you know anything about keeping a, a simple garden, and I know many of you do, or even backyard chickens, you know there is advanced thought that goes into successful agriculture, getting your, your plants to yield fruit. Which is why evolutionists put hunter-gatherers before farmers, farmers on their chronological line of development. 
if you're working from the presupposition of man evolving from beast, then it seems to make sense that hunting and gathering is a simpler task and would come before planting and sowing, before animal, hu- animal husbandry. But that disregards God. And it disregards so much of what was recorded by our ancestors and handed down throughout the generations, not only in the Bible, inspired by God, but also in the stories of every people group on the planet who share in some part that first 11 chapters of Genesis, share it in their written record, their pictographical record, however you want to say that. See, we didn't, invo- we didn't evolve. We devolved into sin. And even with sin, the pre-flood people were intellectually advanced in Genesis 4, 17, just as we are as post-flood people, highly advanced. In Genesis 4, 17, we read that Cain, when his wife gave birth to their son Enoch, built a city, built a city, and he named it after his boy. Graham Hancock says that mankind is a species with amnesia, and I agree wholeheartedly. Christians, we agree on this. In the modern era, it's Darwin's evolutionary theory that knocked us upside the head and caused us to forget our origins. But ultimately, Darwin didn't swing the dumb stick that made us numbskulls. No, Satan swings that stick. He did it before the fall, when he caused Eve to forget God and his word, and he's been doing it ever since. The Bible cuts through the fog of our amnesia, friend. The Bible cuts through that. If Graham Hancock would have started from the Bible, he would have gotten a lot further in his exploration. And he still has time. He's still exploring, apparently, so maybe he will. But that's what we're doing. We will always start from Scripture, end with Scripture, And we will look at the world as scientists, faithful, respectable scientists always have, coming from especially Christianity, giving birth to modern science, looking at it as an exploration of God's word, of what God says. He says this, let's go out there and explore it and see, see how it works out. Not to doubt God, but to further understand God. All right, so uh, we're running out of time. So let me tell you that next week, next week, we're going to have a great show. We're going to dive deeper into the observation that uh, Graham Hancock makes that these megaliths have a connection to the sun, moon, and stars, which relates to this past Sunday's gospel reading. We'll look at what we know about the constellations. That's kind of going to be fascinating, right? We get some mention of the constellations in scriptures. We're going to take a look at that and how the heavens may express Genesis 3.15's Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel message, and how this very well might be one of the first texts, quote-unquote texts, that Satan twists to lead man away from God. That is, we'll look at the evils of astrology condemned in the Bible and their relation to various mythologies of the world. All of that next episode. Thanks, guys, for tuning in to Cross Defense That said, until next time, Christ be with you and with yours. Talk to you later. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.